Buonasera. Welcome to Allen's Italy. Um, sorry that we're a little delayed. We had some technical difficulties here. And uh, you might also hear that there is uh, some work going on in the community center next door, similar to last week, except we're not having loud music. But uh, the community center is in the Restauro. So um, tonight we are going to have a very special show. We're going to have a show called Michelangelo. Let me go to this one second. Let me just go to this and then we'll stop and talk for a moment. The name of the show is Michelangelo in Florence. And we're going to be talking about the work of Michelangelo that is currently located in Florence. I have with me tonight um, a special guest, the guest that I had a few weeks ago when uh, we went into Upper Lazio, my friend Rick Hurst. I'd like to thank you very much for coming on again. Quite welcome. Rick is not only a brilliant man and my, one of my closest friends, but he is also a, um, you'll have to accept this compliment, an expert sculptor. And he has brought some of his um, tools with us tonight to show us how Michelangelo did his sculpture. We'll get to that in a moment, but first I want to say a couple of things. First of all, I need to make a correction. Um, no one really held me to task on this, but last week I referred to a piazza in Rome called the Piazza Bocca della Verita, which means uh, the Piazza of the Mouth of Truth. And there's this round, concrete uh, thing that's in the piazza, which is known to be if people stuck their hand in the mouth and, and, you know, and they were lying when they pulled their hand out, there was no hand left. In medieval times, this was very, a very good technique for getting people to tell the truth. But I called it the face of truth. And it was, that's not, Boca does not mean face. Boca means uh, mouth of truth. So Boca della Verita. If I had you there last week, you see, you would have been telling me all this, but I was a year a week too, too late. So again, Boca della Verita means mouth of truth. Okay, now, um, yesterday I was on the Christina Varga show, Apocalypse Varga. Uh, that's Thursday night from 10 to 11. Uh, Christina was gracious to have me on her show. And um, it was a wonderful experience. I, you know, we discussed a little Italy. We discussed some art, some music, a million things. And uh, Christina is, as you all know from watching her show, extremely charming, very bright, uh, really um, an, has an ebullient personality. Very exciting to be with, and we had uh, a very, very nice hour together talking about a lot of different things. So I would like to just say um, thank you, Christina, again, and um, uh, I look forward to going back on the show. I even promised to do something that I promised I would never do in public, certainly in Woodstock, and that is to play my guitar and sing, which is really something weird because, uh, you know, Woodstock has many, many great guitarists and great singers. And uh, for somebody like me to come on and do something, and I'm like, you know, if, if you know, Happy Traum and John Sebastian are up here, I'm like way, way down here. I'm not even on the chart. But I, I think that I might be able to do something. And if she has me back on, I promised I would do that. Okay. Again, if you'd like to call the show with any kind of a question, please feel free to do so at 845-679. 7777 on her show yeah last night we had three people calling in and that was really fun so um, tonight we are going to be talking about Michelangelo in Florence and this does two things for me personally number one it gets me back to my favorite place in the world which is Florence you all know that I love Florence and have been there 16 times have friends there always go there love the restaurants love the streets and the architecture and, and, the, and the great art. And it also gets me to talk about one of my fav favorite artists of all time, and that is Michelangelo. And this is not really Michelangelo's entire career. We're not going to be talking about all of Michelangelo's work. We're going to be talking about the work that exists in Florence. And this is not necessarily the work that he actually all did in Florence, but it, it, this is the work that's currently there in many of the museums 
uh, around Florence and we'll be showing you those venues as well. Now when you go to, I, I've been to Florence 16 times and when you go to Florence you can't just go to Florence and you know go to the restaurants, go to the hotels, walk around the street. I mean you could do that but after you know 12 or 13 times it starts to get a little boring. So one of the things I try to do when I go to Italy is create a theme. You know, this, you know, today I'm going to go to all of the work by Ghirlandaio, for example, in the famous churches and museums. And another time I might want to focus on Raphael and go to the Palazzo Pitti, which has some beautiful Raphaels. Um, the Uffizi has a couple of his pieces. And, you know, I've been there many times where I've just focused on the work of Michelangelo. So this is something you want to do. You know, when you go to a place, also think about, let's focus on a particular theme. And the theme we're going to discuss tonight is Michelangelo. And I'd like to begin by just talking a little bit about um, his history. And from this point on, my friend, you can just interrupt whenever you feel like it. But I have, you know, specific questions, but if you want to just because uh, you're more of an expert on Michelangelo than I am, so, you know. So, I can tell you that Michelangelo was not born in Florence. He was born in the town of Caprese, which is north, north, northwest of Arezzo. That's correct. Right. Um, and he was born <clears throat> there on March 6, 1475. Um, Unfortunately, his mother died when he was six years old, and he lived with his father, and they moved back to Florence. Correct. His father was the um, Podesta, the mayor uh, for six months under the uh, Florentine Republic uh, in, um, in Caprese, and they moved back to the, basically to the family farm in Settignano. Oh which is not far from uh, Florence. Right. I think it's to the north, yes, northeast of Florence. North. So uh, his father was the mayor, kind of. And, you know, the Bonarote family, you know, it's, it's not Michelangelo. Michelangelo Bonarote. Bonarote, Bonarote is the family name. And um, certainly the, Michel, the, the, the family were families of rather wealthy kind of, I won't say wealthy, but... Noble, nobleman. Yes, uh, it, was, it was considered a noble family. Michelangelo definitely considered a noble family. Um, and uh, a great deal of their social interaction was among the nobility and the very wealthy in the Florentine Republic. Um, his, he claimed that his uh, ancestry went back to the Counts of Canossa uh, about 300 years before he was born. Hmm. So um, they had a great deal of pride in their, in their family background. Okay, now Michelangelo um, got his start at a very, very young age in the workshop of Domenico Ghirlandaio, which was my favorite painter in Florence. Um, and he, um, Michelangelo, was an apprentice in Ghirlandaio's studio. Now, normally, and I told this story once before on this show, that uh, normally um, the family of the budding artist would pay Ghirlandaio to have their sons work um, in their workshop. But in this case, um, uh, Michelangelo's father actually asked Ghirlandaio to pay, pay Michelangelo. Correct. Right? So that, that took place. Michelangelo worked with Ghirlandaio. When Ghirlandaio was working on the um, Turnaboni Chapel at the Church of Santa, Santa Maria, Maria Novella, Novella, which is one of my favorite um, works in all of Florence. It's a beautiful, um, a beautiful chapel that I showed during the Florence show. And then Michelangelo went to apprentice at um, uh, the sculpture garden of Lorenzo de' Medici Correct. under the tutelage of Bertoldo, Giovanni Bertoldo, Bertoldo. who was a student of Donatello. Can Correct. Can talk a little? Yes. Um, 
when um, uh, when Lorenzo de Medici decided to develop a sculpture garden in accordance with the ancients, that is to say, Greco-Roman sculpture, uh, he needed a uh, curator, and uh, Bertoldo was. Uh, uh, was old enough at that time, and he wasn't necessarily heavily involved in the creation of large sculptures. As a matter of fact, by that time he was just creating tabletop sculptures. So uh, he was the one who organized sort of this mini workshop of those um, chosen to be in the in the Medici household. Right. Now, was this the place where? Um what was that fellow's name? Torrigiani. Torrigiani, yeah. Was, a, was in that sculpture garden, Correct. jealous of Michelangelo because Michelangelo was getting all the, you know, notoriety, all, the praise, all yes. the praise, and had a big fight with Michelangelo and punched him in the nose. No, right. Very hard, obviously. And, and broke his nose permanently. And his nose was disfigured from that point on. That's correct. This is a picture of Michelangelo that was uh, painted by a student of his, Daniela uh, da Volterra. Correct. Okay, so this is the first uh, image that we're looking at. And let's look a little bit... Now, I'm using a different method of using uh, slides tonight, so I hope this works out. There's a, a close-up on that. So this is what Michelangelo looked like. I don't know how old he was here, but you would think like maybe in his 60s, maybe 60s 50s or, or 60s, 70s, okay. And this is a, this is a Raphael's version of what Michelangelo looked like during the time that Michelangelo was working on the Sistine Chapel. Correct. Uh, so this was between 1508 and 1512. And uh, this is him kind of brooding. This is the way he was kind of known, at least by Raphael at the time. If this is an accurate portrayal of Michelangelo, you know, he's wearing his boots and looks like he's wearing his work clothes, getting ready to do his thing. This is uh, Michelangelo's own version of what he looked like. This is a sculpture of the, of the deposition. Deposition was when uh, Nicodemus and uh, the Virgin Mary were trying to remove uh, the Christ from the, from the cross. And this is um, a, a type of sculpture known as a deposition. And the fellow on top is Nicodemus, but that's really the face of Michelangelo late in life. Correct. So this is what Michelangelo interpreted his um, uh, pr portrait as looking like. Uh, we'll get back to that later. This is a sculpture done, I believe, also by uh, Daniela, Daniela da Volterra. So this is what Michelangelo also looked like. So we have a, a lot of images of that. Now, I would like to just point out where uh, Caprese, which is now known as Caprese Michelangelo, was located. Here's Florence. Here's Arezzo, and um, Caprese is right in here, in this area, right in here. It's, the pointer keeps going off, but right in this area, here's Arezzo, north of Arezzo was Caprese. And that's where he grew up, in this house. Pretty nice house, I think. Mm -hmm. you know, Actually, it was the best house in Caprese. That's a, that's a you know, really beautiful house. I was here once. This is not the picture I took, this is off the internet. But this is, the, this is the house that Michelangelo grew up in, and this was his view. So this is a beautiful area of Tuscany. I guess you'd consider this kind of um, eastern, kind of eastern Tuscany. Yeah, the, the Arentino. Right. And this is a very beautiful spot. Um, but our tour begins at the Casa Bonarote. Now, this is not a house that Michelangelo lived in. This is a house located in Florence near the church of Santa Croce that Michelangelo bought uh, on speculation. And actually, the people that lived here were his nephew. His nephew and his nephew's family lived here. And it has now been turned into a museum. And the first thing we come to is arguably the first piece that has survived by Michelangelo. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit about this? Yes. Um, this is probably uh, the first or second piece. It was inspired by his discussions with um, uh, the circle of artists and uh, writers 
around the Lorenzo de' Medici. And it's, it depicts, in a way, the battle between the Lapiths and the Centaurs. Uh, in fact, from what I can tell, because my interest in Michelangelo is primarily his sculptural technique and his approach oh, to sculpture, to um, that this relief uh, is, t is to show his knowledge of the structure of the human body. So from this you can't understand that it's the battle between the centaurs and the lapiths. What you understand is this uh, imbroglio of bodies. Uh, this is not um, merely something that um, was invented by Michelangelo. He probably also took this from a work by uh, Paolo Iulo um, uh, called The Battle of the Naked Men, uh, a, an etching that was done um, uh, not long before this was made. So Pronounce that name again for me. Polaiolo. Okay, that's, uh, I cannot pronounce that name. Uh, and all the times I've tried to pronounce it, Polaiolo. Okay, good, thank you. And um, so th this was somewhat polished. It's in three registers. You can see that there's this writhing mass of men uh, fighting each other. And it's it's quite a um, it's it's quite a thing for a 15 or 16 year old boy to have done. Right. Let's keep in mind that when he did this, he was um, a mid-teen. Correct. So that's you know pretty good. We'll, we'll get to that when we get to uh, some of the majors. You know when we get to about Bacchus or maybe David. Right. Now this is was this is arguably the second piece that he did. This is Madonna of the Steps, and you see that Madonna is holding the Christ Child and playing on the stairway is John the Baptist, I believe. Correct. Okay. And so it's this, the stairway to heaven, believe it or not. Yes. I, well, that's where the song came from. I, it's, I, incidentally, I know that song. I could probably play it, but not very well. So these are the two pieces of sculpture that you see, in, you know, reliefs, that you see in the Casa Bonarote. And the Casa Bonarote, you know, has these two pieces of sculpture. And also, this is the Church of San Lorenzo. You'll notice the facade is unfinished. And this was very common in Renaissance churches for some reason. Uh, and I have a teacher at Bard College that I take this stuff with. And she said that the Renaissance architects for some reason had a penchant for not doing the facade, although they did beautiful churches. And this is indeed a Brunelleschi church. But Michelangelo was hired by the Medici's probably because that was their parish church to do the facade, and this was his model. That's correct. Of, uh, of that, which he never actually um, executed. But this is in the Casa Bonarote. This is a sketch for one of his future pieces. So this is, uh, this is, you know. It could be for the Bruges Madonna, one of the, right. one of the presentation drawings. Right. And it, you know, incidentally, let, let me just mention that we won't be talking about all of his sculptures. And, you know, in Rome, there's a load of sculptures that, you know, of course, we're not going to cover because we're going to be doing simply Michelangelo in Florence. But we're not going to be looking at the Pieta, Moses, Leah, Rachel, um, the, risen the, the Risen Christ, thank you for reading my writing, the, the Sistine Ceiling, and the Last Judgment. Okay, that's the Rome stuff, which is a, a load of stuff. Um, and we're also going to not be talking about... Um, a piece in Bologna, right? Saint Petronius. Saint Petronius. Got that one. And the kneeling angel, something. Like right that. and um, right, exactly. In Milan, the Rondinini Pietà, the Bruges Madonna that you just referenced, and in the Louvre, there's two uh, sculptures, the two slaves, right. at, at the Louvre. So these are the things we're not going to be doing because we're just going to be focusing on Florence. Okay, this is another sketch of his and probably done for the Sistine. Right. And this is uh as you explained to me the uh it's a presentation uh model for a river god which was never executed. Um for the most part uh Michelangelo worked in wax. This is a combination of wax and clay and and cloth. And uh, he would these would be shown to prospective clients, especially those 
who could not imagine what the full-size piece would look like. Right. Now, you know, we're not going in chronological order. It, it, to go in chronological order with all of Michelangelo's pieces in Florence, we'd have to literally go from one museum to another museum, back to the other museum. You can, you, logically, you can't do that unless you're, you know, you, you just can't run around from different museums. So this is the Casa Bonarote. And then we go now to the next place where there's a Michelangelo sculpture, and that's at the Church of Santo Spirito. And this is the ch uh, Church of Santo Spirito in the Ultra Arno area. And I referenced this when I did my Florence show. And this is one of my favorite churches, a Brunelleschi church, as you can see there, the Renaissance uh, motif of that. And uh, right down at the end is another of Michelangelo's work. And this is Christ on, on the cross that he did um, as a late teen as a gift to the church because the priest of the main priest of the church gave him permission to dissect corpses. Uh, this was one of the things that they did to learn the musculature of people. And, you know, you couldn't do that to living people, so they used to do it for uh, corpses. And this is a closer view of that. Um, so that's his second piece of, of work. That's and a wooden sculpture. This is wooden, a wooden sculpture. Uh-huh. Okay, now we come to the Bargello. Um, this was the... Um, this was the um, prison and place of execution of many criminals during the Middle Ages, but is now a great sculpture museum. This is a, a distant view. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is the Via Pro Consolo emptying into this area in the front here, which, you know, that covered it, unfortunately. This is the Piazza San Firenze, named after this church. And in this museum are some of his famous works. This is... Uh, his Bacchus, and um, that's a close-up of it, and I think this is a good time to maybe talk about the tools. Okay, um, this is one of his finished pieces, uh, along with the Pietà. Uh, it's an early piece. It was done for Cardinal Riario uh, when uh, he was forced to go to Rome after uh, the death of Lorenzo. The, uh, the tools that are used, I'm going to backtrack a bit and say my, my interest in Michelangelo started out to find out how he made sculpture because it's very difficult uh, today to get any instruction in um, uh, making sculpture, making stone sculpture in the traditional way. Uh, now, the Bacchus, although finished, reveals a lot about how he went about carving. Um, when, we, when we get to the uh, deposition that's in the works of the Duomo, it'll be, uh, it'll be a lot easier to see the different types of uh, tool marks that Michelangelo used. But uh, the tools that he used and the tools that I use are more or less virtually the same, except his are lost. So the, the main two tools that are used in, um, in carving out the basic shape is the martello, this is about a two and a half pound hammer, and the subia, which is a point. It's just one point, and you keep on banging away at this in parallel lines until you uh, get down to within about an inch of the surface that you want to carve, which means that you have to imagine how you carve. Mm. Um, Michelangelo's method was to um, get a block, having once drawn um, a, uh, made a drawing of a potential block and the statue within it. Um, once he received the block, he would draw in charcoal or chalk on the front and on the sides, the two, uh, the three principal faces and then he would start carving directly from the front. Um, most of the time he would have a maquette, sometimes small. A maquette is a small model. Um, mostly um, they were irregular, that is to say not finished, made out of wax. And from his drawing on the marble and the little maquette, 
he would start carving into the into the material and his one of his geniuses was to know when to stop um, he would chop away tremendously with the subia with the point sometimes uh, uh, pieces of marble two or three inches thick um, after he had uh, gone far enough into the uh, carving he would still be facing only front and then he would use another tool uh, called a calcanulo which is a two-pointed chisel this one's small he used a very big one and that he would get within about a uh, half an inch of the surface after that he would use um, a gradina which is a uh, three or more pointed chisel and uh, that would get down to within maybe an eighth of an inch of the surface. And the reason you don't want to go too far is that marble blemishes very easily. And from what I've seen of his marbles, on none of the visible surfaces are there any blemishes. Um, finally, um, on, the, on those that he did not completely finish, he would often take the most sensitive areas and use a very tiny chisel. This is another gradina of three points. And he would very, very gently take that down to the correct layer. In, um, sometimes, as in the Bacchus, he would use a, a scalpello, uh, which is a flat chisel, uh, to um, make things smoother. And then in other areas where he could not, he would use a fila, which is a, um, uh, a shaped riffler, a shaped file. Um, before he would get to the final finish, he would use a hammer called a bocharda, which has got many points on its faces. Uh, a finer point here and a more coarse over here in order to consolidate the surface so he knew what the shadows looked like. After that, they would finish with pumice, and then straw to polish it at, at the end. Mm. And, and statues were not polished completely the way we would often see statues today mm. because they felt that a reflective surface didn't look like flesh. <clears throat> In this particular case, the Bacchus is really uh, a finished piece. And, um, and it really does look like an old... Uh, Greco-Roman sculpture in the sense that the Bacchus here is drunk. He's visibly wobbly on his feet. Leaning backwards. He's leaning yeah. backwards and uh, he's soft and uh, while muscular, not prominently muscular the way a lot of Michelangelo's nudes were. Right. Okay, now these, this is Another Bacchus by another painter. Sansovino. By another sculptor. You know, Jacopo Sansovino. Sansovino. I was hoping you'd know that because I forgot to write down the name of it. Right. And here you see that... that you didn't get the Michelangelo Bacchus. Uh, yes, this one. This is the Michelangelo Little Bacchus. Bacchus. Yeah. And this uh, is the Sansovino Savino Bacchus. And it's also in the Bargello. It's, um, it shows a much more animated, uh, youthful... Um, in the uh, in the now uh, Bacchus who is celebrating wine, not a drunken Bacchus. Right, and this is another Bacchus in bronze. Right, and I don't I don't know who did this. Oh, I have no idea. No idea either. And this is back to the original Michelangelo Bacchus, which was his first major piece. Right. This, this is where I think he began to gain fame, which would then project him to. Well, this is uh, again in the same museum, the Bargello. This is Brutus. Correct. Um, and this is quite a beautiful piece. Yeah, it's only finished. It's not completely... It doesn't have a completely smooth surface. It has a surface made from the tooth chisel. And it's absolutely gorgeous for that reason. Hmm. It is a magnificent piece. This is called the Pitti Tondo, which looks unfinished to me. Is that correct? I would say it's somewhat unfinished. Right. I think that as far as um, Michelangelo was concerned, uh, the face of the Madonna and the face of the Christ child and his torso were, th were done to, to his uh, specifications. Um, 
we don't know whether he left all of the tool marks there deliberately. Um, mm -hmm. He might have, uh, yeah. just for contrast. I'm thinking of, you know, what's going on over here along the side. It looks like... Yes, that's done from the point, straight from the point. Yeah, okay. Okay, and this is... Uh, um, I think this is considered an Apollo. Yeah, the David Apollo. David they Apollo, they're not sure which, at the Bargello. Correct, and that's, that is completely unfinished. Yeah. Because it was done for um, uh, the uh, Papal Legate in uh, 1834. Mm -hmm. And um, when that Papal Legate left, uh, Michelangelo was no longer paid, so he stopped working. You mean 1534? 1534, right. correct. Okay. okay, now this is, now we're coming to his major piece of work in, uh, that, that most people know him of. It's not my favorite piece. My favorite piece is the Pieta in Rome, but this is pretty wonderful. This is the Academia, Galleria Academia, in which is found Michelangelo, arguably his most famous piece, uh, David, which is at the, long, at the end of a long corridor in an opening there. And along the corridor are, you can see one of them on the right side is unfinished sculptures, six of them, that lead up to this. So let's now take a close look. Now, I, I put this in because I wanted to show that this is, this is where David now is, but it used to stand right in front of the Palazzo Vecchio, Palazzo della Signoria, right on the steps, right over here, if I may go back to the, right in this area, right over here is where it stood for hundreds of years before it was moved inside. And this is uh, it now. This was taken from a 16-foot block of marble that, had be, that was begun by a sculptor named Duccio, Duccio. who apparently didn't, did something wrong, that Michelangelo was given this um, commission by the um, Commune of Florence, and they weren't sure at the time where this would go. They weren't sure if this would go on the cathedral or if it would go um, at the Palazzo Vecchio. They weren't completely sure. Correct. But um, this is his masterpiece. Yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant sculpture that doesn't show uh, the triumph of uh, David. It shows David contemplating his enemy contemplating him with faith and with a sureness of victory, which was those two uh, attributes that the uh, Florentine Republic wanted to convey, that it wasn't just, victories didn't just come, it came because of faith and preparedness. Confidence. Confidence. Sprezzatura. Sprezzatura, Sprezzatura right? Okay. Um, now, and what Rick is referring to is that many um, Davids show David with the head of Goliath, standing on the head of Goliath, after the deed was done. Correct. And this was done, of course, before the deed was done. With, you know, and you could just, I think I have a close-up of that. Nope. Oh, this is, the, um, this is Donatello's uh, marble David. You can see that the head of Goliath is at his feet. This is the bronze David, and again, this is after the act has taken place, that's a view of the mammoth hand. The hand's much larger, right? Than, that's correct. And that's his face. And look at you know the determination on his face, looking at Goliath as if to say, I have there's no doubt in my mind that I could take you in a fair fight or an unfair fight. And he's you know determined to do that. And this is representative of the Florentine Republic in the middle of the in the 15th century, this was actually uh, right at the turn of the 16th century, uh, I, I could take you in a fight. This is, uh, we, could, we could take anybody in a fight. And then a committee of, of the famous artists of the time, including Leonardo da Vinci and Botticelli, were on a committee to decide where this should wind up, and it wound up in front of the Palazzo della Signoria for hundreds of years. Okay, now these are the unfinished sculptures that appear along the way, getting to the, you know, in the, in the hallway, on the way to David. And I, I wrote them down because I just cannot remember them. You probably could better than I. This is the young slave. This is the, um, this is for Julius's tomb. The young slave in an unfinished state. 
Because he never finished any of these. Correct. He, st he worked on them simultaneously, but he never finished them because Julius died and then the contract kept changing four times, hmm. um, each time making the monument smaller and smaller, uh, which necessitated abandoning these marbles and starting others. I see. Okay, I didn't, that I didn't know, so that's interesting. This is Matthew. We know that. That, that. That's the one I know. This is like emerging from the uh, from the stone. Now you corrected me on something. I said that Michelangelo used to describe his work as you know he's just the work is there in the marble and he's just chopping away. The how, how did he put that? Um, the uh, the image is in the stone. Uh, you discard what is not the image. Right. So, you know, you could see that he started from the front and worked his way back. Correct. Right. And that's a close-up of St. Matthew. Yes. These, these statues in particular are um, a wonderful lesson. Uh, they make Michelangelo my teacher. Uh, because you can see how he actually approached carving the stone. Uh, how do you carve hands? How do you carve a face? How does one work into corners? How do you uh, model a muscle? And because these are unfinished, you actually have the opportunity to witness how at each stage he thought of the construction process of the carving process. And, um, and you also realize that uh, he was only working from drawings, many, many drawings, I might point out, and uh, drawings which would show the position of the final sculpture from all sides, and also from a small maquette. So it's, it's quite amazing, but it, for me, the, the major influence is how he was able to yield something um, just by working from the front to the back. Okay, and this is another one. This one is Atlas, and he never got to the head, obviously. No. And this is really in an unfinished state. But this is these are wonderful because you get to see how he did it at various stages. Correct. And one of the interesting things is uh, even at this stage, sometimes Michelangelo would polish an area just to see how it related to the other areas that were not finished. Right. Okay, you can see that here, certainly. Now this is uh, the bearded slave. Um, and this is, this looks almost, you know, fairly finished. It really is not. On the back okay. especially, it's not. Right, okay. We're not going to look at the back, but this is, you know. Most that's, of the backs are pretty boring. Here. That's why you're here, to help me kind of focus in on that. This is the awakening slave, and you can sort of see the slave sort of awakening. Certainly it's awakening out of the stone, of which it is still uh, very much a member of. This is, this is called the Palestrina Pieta, which is in, um, also in that museum, the Academia, in that uh, hallway leading up to David. So these are the six unfinished pieces. And you know, people I've been in that museum, and you know, people just walk right down. You know, they, they see David in the distance, and they just walk into the museum, and they see all these things on the side. They, they don't even know what they're walking through, and they just go right to David. And then they see it, and then they just leave and go out the door. And it's, I just can't understand that, but people just do what they do. I don't know. The next piece of work we're going to look at is located in the uh, Galleria uh, Uf the, the Uffizi, which is this building right over here. That's the Uffizi from the outside. This is the, the Arno River. This is the Uffizi. These are probably the people waiting online to get in. If you don't have a reservation, that's not a really good idea to not, not have a reservation. But this is what the Uffizi looks like. And this is the only easel painting that is in the Uffizi by, by Michelangelo. And this is called the Doni Tondo. And I, I know this story. So you can help me out here. But he, he painted this as a commission for a very wealthy man called Angelo Doni, who wanted this for his wedding gift to his wife, and he wanted a holy family. And a holy family usually is uh, Madonna and the child, 
Christ child, and Joseph is sort of, you know, lurking in the background, and Michelangelo kind of integrated the family to really look like a family. There's, you know, Madonna, and she's either handing the Christ child back to Joseph, or he's, you know, handing it to her who's sitting in front of him. And when Angelo Doni got this, he said, what the heck is this? I don't want this. This is not the traditional kind of um, holy family that I'm used to. So take it back. I don't want any part of it. Then he told the story to a friend of his who knew Michelangelo, who was by now famous for having done David and, and Bacchus and all this other stuff. The Pieta was done prior to that as well, who said, what are you, out of your mind? Go back to him and tell him you'll take the painting. This is Michelangelo, Il Divino, D Divino, right? So he goes back to Michelangelo, and Michelangelo says, I'll, I, I changed my mind, I'll take the painting. And Michelangelo says, well, you could certainly have it, but it's going to cost you twice as much money now. <laughs> he paid the twice as much money, and this uh, has wound up in the Uffizi. So it's a beautiful piece, it's very colorful, and very offbeat, as Michelangelo, this is actually a better shot of it. Right. Um, it's gorgeous. The, uh, uh, this is unprecedented in terms of the relations of each of the people and um, how their attitudes turn toward the Christ child. It's really, it's really quite extraordinary. The, the design is so beautifully circular mm -hmm. and circular uh, right at the top, not just um, in, the, in the outside structure, but all those arms circling back, as you say, yield, that, yield this as an image of a family. Right. And, you know, usually Joseph kind of plays this secondary role, almost like forgotten, because, you know, he's, he wasn't, according to the, uh, the lore of the Christian church, he wasn't really part of the conception of the child. So, you know, why even have him? But this is very, very interesting. I've always loved this piece. And it's the only piece by Michelangelo in the Uffizi, which I always stop to look at. We now go to the Church of San Lorenzo. And that's it over there. It's another view of it. Um, yet another view. And this is the stairway to the Laurentian Library. Um, Lorenzo is the Laurentian involved here. And this was designed by Michelangelo, but completed after he had died. And this is a very interesting conception. I couldn't find a better picture than this. But there's two sets of stairway on the outside, as you can see, without the railing, and then a central staircase in the beginning. So it's really very symmetrical and very beautiful, leading up to the library. And then, this is a better view of it. The central uh, stairway was for the nobility. The side stairs were for their, um, uh, for their grooms. Ah. Very interesting. I did not know that. Thank you for that. That's what it looked like inside. And the pieces, you know, the, um, the, the manuscripts were stable and people moved around because they didn't, you know, it wasn't like a library where, for example, people go up to the desk and say, I'd like to take this book out or that book out. So, you know, that's not the way it happened. This is the Palazzo Vecchio. And this is some more sculpture of Michelangelo's. This is Victory. Um, which is, looks a little unfinished as well, in the Palazzo Vecchio. I want to move, I have to move a little bit here. We have a little more time because we started late, but I want to get on to a major piece of work, pieces of work by him. This is the um, Museum of the Duomo, right next to the Duomo, uh, the cathedral. And this is the next piece of work, which is the piece we started with you know, earlier on, which is the deposition with Michelangelo um, in the role of Nicodemus at the top. So, you know, we discussed this, I think, earlier, so we could yes. move on. I want to move on. That's his close-up of his face. And I'm going to ask Alan how much time we have. What, what do you think, Alan? Five minutes, ten minutes? What do you think? You have that seven minutes. Seven minutes. Okay, good. We're going to have to finish up. Back to the Medici Chapel. This is the Church of San Lorenzo. And this is the Medici Chapel. And inside the Medici Chapel 
is what's called the old sacristy. This is where the, um, where the monks, I think, dressed. And they used to keep their vestments under here. You see, that pops up, so that's one of the problems with this system. But you, under there was, well, yeah, they used to keep their clothing. And this is the tomb of Cosimo il Vecchio, which is the patriarch of the family. Pa patrie um, della casa. Uh, uh, father of his country. Yeah. I'm going to say it in English. Okay, father of his country. country. And this is the old sacristy. At the time, it was the new sacristy, but then um, this was Michelangelo designing the new sacristy, which was intended for the tomb of um, Lorenzo de' Medici and his brother Giuliano, who was murdered in the Pazzi conspiracy in 1478, I believe. And uh, you could see in the background here, this is where the Medici tomb is. This is where Lorenzo de' Medici is buried with his brother Giuliano, but it's the uh, sculptures around the outside that are the most famous. Now, I know which one this is, I think. I wrote it down. Oh, you know, we forgot to talk about the, uh, the nicknames. Oh, okay. So we're going to go to that in a minute. Yeah, I didn't write that down, perhaps. Which one is which? I wrote it on, no, I have it right here. Okay, so this is um, Lorenzo de' Medici. Right in the middle here, uh, uh, this is Lorenzo de' Medici's tomb, but not the Lorenzo, the famous Il Mag Magnifico. This is a Lorenzo who was uh, a, um, a nephew, I believe, the, called the Duke, Duke of Urbino, who lived only 28 years from 1491 to 1519, and Dawn and Dusk. And this is a very famous sculpture. This was given to him as a commission by, I believe, was it Leo or Clement? Clement. Clement. Clement VII, who was a, um, a Medici family member, Giuliano's bastard child, who became Pope, and he commissioned the, this chapel. And so that's Lorenzo de' Medici, but not the famous one. That's a close-up. Very beautiful. He's the thinker. He's the thinker. And, you know, dawn and dusk. And then we come to the next one, which is Giuliano de' Medici, but not the famous Giuliano, who was Lorenzo's brother. This was the Duke of Nemours, who was also a nephew of Lorenzo, who lived 38 years. Um, and this is night and day, are these sculptures over here. So this is Giuliano and night and day. And I have a little close-up of Giuliano, looking very heroic in his military garb and the sculptures at the base night and day okay and finally we come to the church of Santa Croce the reason being is that we're at the end of our presentation and this is Michelangelo's tomb so when you go into the Church of Santa Croce, which is kind of known as the Pantheon of Florence because famous Florentines are buried here, this is where Michelangelo is buried for eternity. And that brings us to the end of our show for tonight. So I'd just like to say to Rick, thank you very much for coming and helping me go through this. It was a pleasure having you. Your expertise was invaluable. And um, on my behalf, I'd like to say to you, buona notte e buona fortuna. Si. Good night and good luck, and I'll see you next week. Thank you very much for watching.